where the blast will take place is so shielded that there is no possibility of any pollution of the atmosphere. The $6 million project is a major step in peaceful atomic use. October 2nd, 2007. A terrible tragedy unfolded in the mountains 40 miles west of Denver, Colorado. Five contract painters were trapped by a chemical fire deep inside a hydroelectric plant tunnel. The plant was owned by Xcel Energy, a major regional electric power company. The fire
The five workers inside the penstock had died of smoke inhalation over an hour earlier. The following day, responders found their bodies near the bottles of air. The CSB found that the accident at Excel's Cabin Creek plant highlights three key safety issues. The lack of regulatory limits for bringing flammable materials into permit-required confined spaces. Excel Energy's flawed process for contractor selection and oversight. And the lack of preparation for possible emergencies. One of the covert tactics of the Viet Cong is to use tunnels as infiltration or escape routes, or munition storage areas and assembly points for major munitions. The tunnels may run beneath cities or towns, thus complicating their destruction. Project Tunnels was initiated to evaluate two systems. One, a chemical, for forcing the evacuation of the tunnels, and if possible, to maintain a residual deterrent. And the other, an explosive demolition system, this film deals only with the work of Edgewood Arsenal, using riot control agent CS in the chemical system. The work with explosive demolition systems was accomplished by Picatinny Arsenal. Scale models of typical Viet Cong tunnels were constructed to determine which system may be the most effective in the evaluation tests. The tunnel complex was specified by the Limited Warfare Laboratories. This tunnel was 375 feet in length and varied in depth to 13 feet below ground level. Based on a quick response to the need for tunnel denial, available potential systems were screened. Selected for final evaluation were the five following systems. Riot control hand grenades. Dry agent dispersers. The Mars turbine generator with CS in solution. An experimental expendable launcher system which propels CS submunitions. Mighty Might, a commercially available air blower of the agricultural sprayer and duster type mounted on a pack board used with M7 type CS grenades. The Mighty Might costs less than $350. The gasoline powered blower weighs about 32 pounds, including one gallon of fuel for two hours of operation. A plastic sheet was thrown over the tunnel entrance and the blower was placed at the edge of the opening. Dirt shoveled onto the edges of the sheet formed a seal. Four agent grenades were dropped into the tunnel at a rate of one grenade per two minute interval. And the blower driven agent cloud began its traversal of the underground maze. Progress of the agent's movement throughout the complex could be gauged by watching the vent pipes. To accelerate the travel of the agent cloud, the vents were covered by bags as the agent was emitted from the vent pipe. However, leaving the vents uncovered does not interfere with the penetration of the tunnel. Chemical sampling devices along the tunnel route measured agent concentration at various points. In some of the tests, a wet blanket, a plastic sheet, and a plywood panel were placed in the tunnel to determine whether these barriers would retard the flow of agent. These barriers were all defeated by the agent cloud. In this particular film sequence, however, no barriers were employed. Observation of the blower and grenade method also brought out the fact that HC smoke grenades could be employed along with or instead of the riot control agent grenades to facilitate discovery of other entrances and vents of the tunnel system and to make the tunnels untenable. However, the smoke left no residual hazard. The tests proved that forced movement of the agent was a prerequisite to complete penetration of the tunnel. The Mighty Might grenade system was the most effective because it was man-portable and propelled the agent into the innermost recesses of the tunnel complex. 
It was demonstrated that the agent cloud reached the first vent pipe within 30 seconds, a distance of 30 feet. In one minute and 35 seconds, the cloud had diffused 120 feet to the second vent and entrance B. After four minutes, penetration had advanced to vent number three, about 200 feet. At nine minutes, the agent cloud was observed at vents four and five, approximately 360 feet. Vent five was located at the munitions assembly room. Within 10 minutes after the actuation of the grenade and blower system, the entire tunnel complex had been traversed. These tests revealed that the commercial blower used with either the HC smoke grenade or the M7 type grenades provided the most complete penetration of tunnels and caves. Saturation of the tunnels with CS produced a residual hazard which rendered them untenable for a period in excess of three days. that delivers 64 agent canisters on target, each of which is loaded with a 60-40 combination of pyro mix and CS. Train fused, the firing cycle is completed in 10 seconds and covers an area of more than 4,500 square meters.
exclusive look inside the drug tunnel recently discovered between the U.S.-Mexico border. It was discovered on Thanksgiving, but just opened up for us by authorities on both sides of the border this evening. We've been around here before, showing you some incredibly sophisticated tunnels, but nothing quite like the one we are about to show you. For one thing, it has its own rail network. For another, when the San Diego Joint Tunnel Task Force located it, they also nabbed eight people and more than 20 tons. That's 20 tons a pot. There are two entrances here in Otay Mesa in two warehouses, but we entered the tunnel as the drug traffickers did on the Mexican side of the border in a nondescript house on a quiet residential street. From the outside, it looks like just an ordinary two-story house in a residential neighborhood here in Tijuana. Across the street, a couple hundred yards away, is the U.S.-Mexico border. On the U.S. side, San Diego and Otay Mesa. As soon as you enter the house, you enter into the kitchen, you realize nothing is really what it seems. This is not just a normal residential kitchen. First of all, there's big pylons of uh, wood here that would be used to, to shore up the, the tunnel below. But in two of the rooms, right off the kitchen, you find these sandbags, hundreds of them. It's two rooms piled floor to ceiling, sandbags filled with dirt and soil. This is the overflow soil that was dug out of the tunnel. The traffickers would be concerned about people uh, in the neighborhood seeing them removing soil from the house. It's about 80 or 90 feet from the kitchen, from the entrance. From the outside, it looks like just an ordinary two-story house in a residential neighborhood here in Tijuana. Across the street, a couple hundred yards away, is the U.S.-Mexico border. On the U.S. side, San Diego and Otay Mesa. As soon as you enter the house, you enter into the kitchen, you realize nothing is really what it seems. This is not just a normal residential kitchen. First of all, there's big pylons of uh, wood here that would be used to, to shore up the, the tunnel below. But in two of the rooms, right off the kitchen, you find these sandbags, hundreds of them. It's five, two rooms piled floor to ceiling, sandbags filled with dirt and soil. This is the overflow soil that was dug out of the tunnel. The traffickers would be concerned about people uh, in the neighborhood seeing them removing soil from the house. It's about 80 or 90 feet from the kitchen, from the entrance, down this ladder to the actual entrance to the, the tunnel. What's remarkable about this tunnel for the authorities is, check out the walls, they've put cinder block to shore up the walls here. So they've really invested a lot of time uh, and a lot of money, perhaps even more than a million dollars, maybe even two million dollars in order to build this tunnel. It might have taken them as much of a year. Um, but I, I've never seen, I've been in two of these tunnels now, two of the, the sophisticated tunnels over the last couple years. I've never seen cinder block walls like this uh, used to actually shore up uh, any part of the tunnel. And then, the other thing that's fascinating about this tunnel is um, not only is there some electricity, so there's actually lighting through that we've seen in a number of very sophisticated tunnels. You can see the actual the electrical cables that are running through. Some tunnels sometimes have even phone systems, telephones. This one doesn't have a telephone. But what this does have, which again, I've never seen before and authorities say, uh, it is another sign of just how sophisticated this is, are these carts. They actually have put in an entire rail system um, with these push carts that you could load drugs on and just push down down the rails. There's one cart here uh, and there's one already further down. So there's actually, you realize that there's three carts here. This is the second one. You can see again, they really spent a lot of time shoring up these walls. Usually you'll see, you'll still see the, the, uh, the actual um, stone wall or the the dirt wall of the tunnel with just a few pieces of wood but this is this is a solid wall of wood that they've created and basically it's as far as the eye can see down um, that's always a fear when you're when the drug traffickers are digging these tunnels that the tunnels may actually collapse on them the tunnel is about a half mile long it's about the size of seven football fields and it was built authorities believe by members of the Sinaloa cartel Sinaloa cartel is also believed to be behind one of the other very sophisticated drug tunnels that was found in early November. So this is actually the second sophisticated tunnel that they found, both of which they believe were built by the Sinaloa cartel, which is a cartel that traditionally didn't operate in Tijuana, but has really moved into Tijuana and uh, taken over 
part of the drug operations in the city. U.S. authorities believe that as they started to get underneath U.S. territory, started to get closer to their destination, perhaps they grew more impatient, didn't want to make a lot of noise, so they didn't spend a lot of time shoring up the sides um, of these walls. And about half a mile from where the tunnel began in that house in Mexico, we come to just about the end of the tunnel here. We're still about 70 feet below ground at this point, but this is a large room that was created that they carved out of the earth. You can see all the, uh, the jackhammer markings here. It's still only about, maybe this is about four feet tall. Uh, this is the widest part of the tunnel that we've seen. It's about 15 feet wide. Found a lot of equipment here. There's a, an old hoe. Here's a drill that was used by the traffickers. All part of the equipment, all these sandbags, of course, empty sandbags, which they would use, fill up with soil, and then cart the soil back to the Mexico side. But for U.S. authorities, of most interest, what they found in this large room was three tons of marijuana found in this room, as well as in bundles a little bit further up. The tunnel begins to move upward uh, toward the surface in these very large steps that have been just basically hewn uh, out of the, the rock and soil. It's a very steep climb, climbing about 70 feet from that big room downstairs to, uh, to an area where about probably about now 10 feet or so away from the uh, street level. And it just goes uh, straight up. There's actually an area where you can stand up for the first time, fully upright. And if you look right up here, that's actually the bottom of a sidewalk right outside this warehouse in San Diego. So we're very close now to the surface, to the ground. And then the, uh, this is the hole, the concrete flooring. And I'll show you where we are. This is where the tunnel emerges on the U.S. side. This is a warehouse in Otay Mesa. When they discovered this tunnel, it was just covered, the hole was covered with this piece of, uh, of sheetrock. And there were these pallets filled with fruits and oranges and stuff, just in case somebody came by to see if this was a legitimate warehouse. It's not much of a cover, but uh, it's amazing when you drive by this warehouse, you'd never know that this is... Uh, the place where one of the most sophisticated drug tunnels they found emerges. Federal investigators in Southern California say they found what could be the longest cross-border drug tunnel. They announced Wednesday that the tunnel's discovery led to a massive drug bust. The tunnel apparently stretches the length of more than eight football fields from Tijuana in Mexico to San Diego. Carter Evans shows us how agents seized nearly $30 million worth of drugs. Barely wide enough to squeeze a person through, this unassuming hole transforms into an elaborate underground maze. Clear. Zigzagging for half a mile, the cramped compact tunnel stretches across the U.S.-Mexico border, and investigators say it's an unprecedented drug smuggling system. We believe this to be the longest tunnel uh, that we've discovered in this district to date. As part of an eight-month investigation, federal agents seized more than one ton of cocaine and seven tons of marijuana, worth nearly $30 million. The tunnel stretched from Tijuana all the way to this industrial park in San Diego where the drugs were loaded. Only about three feet wide, the tunnel was remarkably complex. Ten feet down in this hole, it's really a completely different story. It is equipped with a ventilation system and a commercial large elevator that I would estimate could hold eight to ten people. Investigators say this is the largest single seizure of cocaine related to a tunnel along the California-Mexico border. Most of the cocaine smuggled into the U.S. comes in on small boats and even makeshift submarines. We saw this firsthand when we traveled with the Coast Guard last year following a record $200 million drug bust in the Pacific. So far, six people, including one U.S. citizen, have been arrested in connection with this latest seizure, and they face drug trafficking charges. For CBS This Morning, Carter Evans.